Good morning, my name is Kalen Eckenrod, and I am a tr at Trinity. I am the Trinity Student Ministry Assistant now. Um, and I was asked if I could do the morning meditations for Brian, and he found somebody, found somebody to do the morning meditations for him. So it's not just Brian here. Um, <laughs> you're welcome, Brian. Uh, and to start off the morning meditations, I just wanted to ask the question to all of you. Um, what is your favorite fictional book? Favorite fictional book? And then you can post that in the comments, your favorite fictional book. And while you guys are posting, I'll just kind of explain mine right now. It's actually <laughs> more about Brian Bremner. Um, Brian... He introduced me to these books. Uh, they're called the King Killer Chronicles, um, and I'm on the second one right now. But it feels like each book that I read in this series is um, like it continually gets better. <laughs> so the first one was um, The Name of the Wind, which was incredible, just about kind of this guy named Kaboti who um, went to a university and he. Yeah, he went through like a lot of trauma in life. <laughs> like his, his family got killed by these people, so he went to this university to figure out how to get revenge. And now in the second book right now, he's um, he's still at that university. But I don't know, like this, this series intrigues me more and more, and it feels like the boring parts that would be usually in like another book um, are actually like the really good parts in this book. And then that makes the really exciting parts even better. Um, oh. So I don't know, I really, really appreciate um, that, that series, The King Killer Chronicles. Um, so yeah, if you, if you have a favorite fictional book that you wanted to share with us, I would love to hear. I just kind of post that in the, um, yeah, in the comment section. Brian's got a favorite, Elfstones and Shannara, a twist, not a C.S. Lewis. I know, okay. All right, yeah. Uh, also, thank you, Brian. Yes. Um, but yeah, uh, if you got a favorite fictional book, throw that in the chat. Um, thank you, Ryan. Stormlight Archive. All right, I will. I will check that out. That'd be good. Hmm. Um, so we're gonna be in First Peter four. And before we really dive into the text, I'm just going to pray for us quick, um, and then we'll jump right in. So Lord, um, would, you, would you be over our hearts, Holy Spirit? Would you uh, enlighten our eyes, help us to find gold um, in these books, or in this chapter, Lord, help us to find uh, what you're trying to tell us. Um, yeah, and just help our hearts to be softened, um, help, it, help us to receive what you have to say and actually apply it to our lives, Lord. Um, yeah, would you, would you just um, help, us to, help us to find the gold in this passage, Lord? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. If you're just jumping in, we're going to be in First Peter four um also in the comment section um you can place some prayer requests i also asked the question earlier what's your favorite fictional book you can throw that in there um but yeah i'm just going to jump right in and i'm just going to read the first section here in first peter four um and then because it's morning meditations we're just going to meditate on it for about like a minute or so um and then we're going to come back kind of explain everything uh, apply it to our lives so uh let me read here um, First Peter 4, 1 Peter 4.1 Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. 
But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel is preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality, uh, hospitality to one another without grumbling as each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God might be glorified through Jesus Christ, to Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Um, <clears throat> so let's... Let's... Uh, Let's actually meditate on this. Um, and so for the next like 30 seconds or so, I just want you to think, what is the main point um, in this section of 1 Peter that, that Peter's trying to get across? What is the main point? Uh, so just think about that for the next 30 seconds. And you can post that in the comments if you want to. So, um, as I was reading this last night, um, I was wondering, like, what is the main point? What is Peter trying to tell me here? And it just felt like there were so many different points that Peter was trying to make. Um, it felt like my mind was going from one place to another, um, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, something about suffering, something about the glory of God, about arming ourselves with with Christ, about the end times, about all these things. And so I was like, what, what are you trying to teach me here, Peter? Um, what are you trying to teach me here, Holy Spirit? And so I was just like, you know what, I need some help. Um, and so I went to a couple commentaries, um, kind of looked up some things. Um, and I think uh, from reading that, they're, um, they're, the biggest point that they make in this is that it's all about time. It's all about not wasting our life. Um, and there's just a common thread all throughout uh, this passage that is just time. Like, don't waste your time. Use it. Use it. Have a right attitude in your time. Um, and so uh, I just want to kind of highlight four attitudes that really help us uh, not waste our life. Okay, four attitudes that help us not waste our life. So the first one is don't waste your life, but have a militant attitude toward sin. And this is, comes from the first three passages. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Arm yourselves. Right there. Arm yourselves. Like, get your weapons out. Arm yourselves. Uh, for how, whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh. No longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Um, and verse 2 just kind of highlights that. So as to live for the rest of the time in human flesh. So as to live for the rest of the time, right? So time, time's a big deal here. Have a militant attitude towards sin um, for the rest of your time. He's saying arm yourselves with the same way of thinking as Christ did. Well, what did Christ do? Christ, he went on the cross and he died and he defeated sin. He beat sin. And that's the same attitude that we're supposed to have. We're supposed to have that same thinking. We're supposed to arm ourselves with the same thinking as we're going to beat sin. We're going to beat it. Um, and then it kind of goes on to say, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So suffering, right? Christ suffered. Um, he ceased from sin. So there's something about suffering that makes us holy. Suffering leads to sanctification. Um, that's what I see here. And so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So the ultimate goal that Peter is calling these elect exiles to, is to stop living for human passions and start living for the will of God. Have a militant attitude toward our sins. Kill our sins and live for the will of God. Um, so that's kind of our first ad. Don't waste your life, but have a militant attitude towards sin. 
Um, and the next point is don't waste your life, but be patient with those who are lost. Have a patient attitude towards those who are lost. Um, so that comes from verse 3 to verse 6. So I'm going to read that for us. For the time that's past, that is past suffices, for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead. That though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. So, <clears throat> what I see here is, um, we're going to be maligned. <laughs> We, uh, Peter's telling the elect exiles, he's like, you guys are going to be maligned. You're not going to partake in the same debauchery. You're not going to partake in the same sins as these Gentiles did uh, because you're going to be different. Um, and when we're different, when we're holy, uh, we kind of stand out and people like to pick on people who stand out who are different in the crowds. So they malign us. Um, and so what, what I think Peter's trying to tell us here um, I think this comes from verse uh, 5 and 6, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So like he's saying, don't be defensive. <laughs> don't, when, when you are maligned, be patient. Don't get all defensive. Um, don't point out their hypocrisies. But just trust. Trust in Jesus. Trust the God who will judge the living and the dead, who will judge their accounts. Um, and trust the gospel that was preached to those who are dead so that they might live in the spirit. Trust in God. Um, have a patient attitude. Don't be defensive. Don't be all worked up. Um, and I struggle with that a lot. Um, being defensive is difficult for me. I like to, I got, I got my ego that I got to defend. Like you can't bring me down. Um, but yeah, I, I, that's not the way God is calling us. To work. That's not the way God is calling us to interact um, with Gentiles, with sinners. Um, so that's that's the second attitude. The third attitude is uh, don't waste your life, but have a fervent attitude towards the saints. Have a fervent attitude towards the saints. So the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling as each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. So God, is, or Peter, is calling these elect exiles. He's like, even in this suffering, um, love one another. Uh, love the church right now. Uh, the, end, the end is coming. Um, Jesus is coming back. We don't know when. Um, he's just calling us to have that attitude of like knowing Jesus is coming back. So have this fervent attitude towards one another. Like love one another more than the world loves each other. Um, like love the church. Um, because love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. Um, which means show, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Uh, use your gift to build up the church. Use your gift to build up the church. Figure, that, that, that calls for us to figure out our gifts. Um, so so what, what Peter is telling us here is have a fervent attitude towards the saints. Like let's love each other as a church. Um, even in the midst of maybe some different theology or different doctrine. Um, like obviously let's have those conversations, but let's, um, let's love each other no matter what. Um, and... <laughs> By loving our, each other, right, uh, then the world will see that we are His. We are His disciples. So let's love one another. And the third, or the fourth attitude here, is don't waste your life, but live for God's glory. Live for God's glory above all else. Um, so eleven says, verse eleven says, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified. Through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Um, Peter's saying that um, whatever we do, let's do it for the glory of God. And that takes 
the <laughs> ruthless killing of ourselves, um, ruthless killing of our ego, so that everything we do is not about me, but it's about God. And honestly, when we do that, we have more power, we have more strength, uh, we have more um, joy and peace. Um, because when we're nothing, that means God can be everything in us. When we're nothing, that means God can be everything in us. And God is the fullness of joy, and He has the pleasures forevermore. And when He's inside of us, we get that. <laughs> we get that. He gets to live through us. Um, he gets all the glory, but we get all the good. We get that joy. We get that peace um, from, from being nothing so that God can be everything. So those are the four attitudes for, not, for us not to waste our life. Um, number one, have a militant attitude towards sin. Uh, have a patient attitude towards, attitude towards the lost. Um, have a fervent attitude towards the saints. And have an attitude that is all for God's glory. Um, so those are the four attitudes that we can have to not waste our life. Um, and so uh, we got a little bit left to go um, in this passage here. Um, but before I keep going, if you guys have any prayer requests, just throw those in the comments section. So once, once I'm done here, I'm going to pray for everybody. Um, but I'm just going to read on uh, from verse 12 to 19. And we'll go pretty fast through this. So it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. For rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will uh, entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Um, so to just kind of illustrate the main point of this passage, I'm going to read a story about a um, 17th, I think 17th century reformer named William Tyndale. Um, and I totally stole this from uh, N.T. Wright's um, commentary, but it's just so good. I got to read it to you. So William Tyndale, English reformer, really good guy, right? He, he was persecuted um, by the English church, by the Catholic church for translating the Bible. But here, I just wanted to share the story here. So when the early English reformer, William Tyndale, was translating the New Testament into English. He was living in hiding, in exile in Northern Europe, translating the Bible into the vernacular language, which was strictly forbidden. The official clor clergy were worried that it would bring heresy into the church. Tyndale was short of funds for the project and anxious to sell copies of the first edition of his translation so that he could fund further work and revisions he knew were needed. But would people in England be prepared to buy his work? knowing they might get in trouble if they were found with it in their possession. Then it happened. All right, so the Bishop of London got wind of this project and was furious. He was determined to stamp this nonsense out once and for all. So he commissioned his agents to buy up all the copies they could find and bring them together to be burned. But little did he realize that he was feeding the problem he was trying to prevent. He got the books all right, and he destroyed them, but the money he paid enabled Tyndale to move to the all-important second phase of the project. And it is, it is his translation, though not always acknowledged, that forms the basis and the backbone for the world-famous King James Bible of 1611. Um, so, what, what kind of is, what I love about that story is, like, the, the, the English church, they were like, we're going to, take everything we're gonna we're gonna think we're gonna throw the punch um but what actually happens is um it helps willing tyndale and that's kind of what happens in this passage that's what god's calling us here in this passage is like take our suffering 
let's not be surprised at suffering when it comes. But when it does come, we can know that uh, it will be used for our better. So Satan thinks he's getting the big punch in on us. But really what's happening is like we're being even more made or formed in the image of God, formed, um, becoming more holy like Jesus. Um, so really, uh, it's like jujitsu. Take the punch, use the energy back at him, punch Satan right back in the face. Um, so yeah, that is uh, 1 Peter 4. Um, and I'm just going to pray for us here, and then we'll see you all tomorrow. Uh, Lord, um, I just pray for everyone who's watching right now or has watched. Uh, I pray for our hearts. I pray that um, we are not surprised at any suffering that comes at us. So we're not defensive. We're not defensive when we're maligned. We're not defensive when someone tries to beat us. We're, that we're not surprised when the day comes here in America where, where that happens, God. Um, and that when, when we are ready, that we'd be more than willing to accept that suffering. All for the glory of you, Jesus. All for the sake of our holiness. So that we can draw even closer to you, God. So that our ego dies, so that you can be everything in us so that we can have that joy and peace that you can only supply, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, we'll see you all next week. Or not next week, tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>